Welcome to Mr. Surface's videos using the uh, textbook. The pages we'll be annotating today are pages six and seven. Page six begins the introductory story to unit one, rites of passage. And the essential question in this unit are, what are some milestones on the path to growing up? Um, so we'll wanna keep that essential question in our heads as we read and annotate this text. All right. This is the launch text in a nonfiction narrative. This text presents a nonfiction narrative, a type of writing in which an author explores an experience using descriptive details and events. This is the type of writing you'll develop in the performance-based assessment at the end of the unit. As you read, look at the way the girl's reactions change as she understands the situation better. So we now know to look at, to examine the girl's reaction and how they change and how they might make the situation better. Red roses, and there's a picture of red roses there. When I think of red roses, I often, my connection here is I often think of love. I often think of affection. I think of Valentine's Day. Those are just some of the connections I have with red roses. When I was in middle school, so, it, if it's starting that way, it appears to me that it might be a story that an adult is reflecting on. So it's easier to see your milestones when you're thinking about the past as opposed to living the past. When I was in middle school, what I wanted most was to fit in. That's all anybody wants in middle school. In middle school, you're suspicious of anyone who stands out for any reason. There's certainly a connection that I'm making here. Is this true at Stewart? And my connection comes with a question, right? Is Stewart Middle School this type of middle school that's being described here? Derek stood out and we all avoided him. Okay, so if I had to guess, then Derek will be the one that this girl is reaction, reacting to. And her first reaction is avoidance. All right, so there's one. I'm gonna put a number one next to avoid it and try and keep track of these changes. My mom had always told us never to make fun of people, so I never did. I can't say the same for my friends. So one of her other reactions was to avoid making fun. So reactions, avoids, teasing, Derek. So her first reaction is she's avoiding him. The second is that she does avoid teasing him. So I see sort of a, a continuum and I'm betting the mom character here is being brought up because the mom probably offers some wisdom that is appreciated later on by this character. Not that they were outright mean or anything, but they'd whisper behind their hands. And it was obvious that they were uh, it was obvious who they were whispering about. All right, not so nice. I took no part in this and her refusal to take part in this whispering is another reaction, so there's our third. She's avoiding teasing, she's avoiding the whispering, as I said, but I have to admit, I steered clear of Derek like everyone else. This notion of being like everyone else. What are some milestones on the path to growing up? The connection I have to the essential question here is, when do you not behave like everyone else, and when do you behave like an individual? As opposed to being part of the group. Despite my standoffishness, Derek started leaving me little gifts. Every couple of days, something new. Treasures out of a cereal box or a gum machine would turn up in my locker, in my desk, in the pocket of my jacket. I did not acknowledge these things and immediately tossed them into the back of my closet when I got home. So there's another reaction right there. I immediately tossed them into the back of my closet when I get home. We'll number that as reaction four. I guess I could have told my mother, but I didn't. Reaction five. And my question is, why not tell mom? Right? And of course, she's avoiding telling her mother here, right? She's avoiding telling your mother here, and she's acting on mom's advice there. Sometimes you have to figure things out for yourself. Is this idea here, is that a milestone? Is she already maturing in paragraph three already? The weeks passed. I continued to ignore Derek and made sure to stay out of his way. So another reaction is continuing to, pa uh, another reaction is continuing to ignore over the course of time. I'm gonna put a little timeline there, all right? And write the word ignore above it. Still the presence continued, a different one each time. I resented the fact that he did not spend so much time, uh, that he spent so much time thinking up ways to get my attention. So there's our sixth reaction, and it's one of resentment. Pity or avoidance, now it's resentment. I resented the fact that he spent so much time thinking up ways to get my attention. Didn't he have better things to do? My friends teased me. Ooh, Lila has a boyfriend, Lila has a boyfriend, they sang out. It didn't seem fair. Right? So, now she has to react not only to Derek, but she has to react to her friends. I tried so hard to fit in, to fade into the woodwork, but here I was being teased, the butt of a joke the center of attention, all right? So she's resentful that she's been made the center of attention, all right? That kind of develops the reaction she had there. One day, Derek strode up to me in the lunchroom and presented me with a dozen roses, red roses, 
a dozen roses. I think we should definitely underline it when we get to something that seems um, to connect with the title. A dozen roses. Red, long stem, and fluted paper wrapped with a note tucked inside. I know I'm not the coolest kid, but take these roses, you'll be glad you did. Here, I think it's worth taking a moment to think about imagery. And it's worth taking a moment to look at how these roses are described. They're described pretty carefully, right? A dozen roses. Red, one descriptor. Long stemmed, long descriptor. In a fluted paper. This phrase in particular is vivid. It helps us to imagine it better. And it draws our attention to the loveliness of the roses. So part of me think, thinks that these roses are in contrast to some of the uglier behaviors of some of her friends. So friends' reactions. And of course, not just her friends' reactions, but also her own insecurity. She'd rather, what did she say? Fade into the woodwork? Yeah. That's an idiom. That means would rather not be paid attention to. Uh, and then of course there's this little rhyme. Hmm, not a great rhyme. <laughs> All right, let's move on to page seven. Okay, we continue with page seven. I should have been flattered, but I was good and angry. Good and angry is one of those phrases. Like, oh, he was good and mad. Oh, I was good and angry. So angry I don't hear quite as often, but. The fact that he stood there grinning lopsidedly, roses in hand, with that hopeful look in his eyes, made me even angrier. I wanted to squash him like a bug. Squash him like a bug is a cliche. Which tells you that this is probably not a professional writer. Above, the fact that he stood there grinning lopsidedly, roses in hand, with that hopeful look, that's all visualization. Or imagery. Here, it's a visual image. Imagery can refer to anything that uh, titillates the senses in, in uh, writing. The imagery here describing Derek. Leave me alone, I growled. Don't you get it? Go away! Hold on one moment while I let my dog in. Good boy, good dog. Right, let me just finish this real quick. It's my dog, Preach. You can hear him walking around, and he has a little bell on his collar. Okay, hi, Preach. Hi, you're a good dog. Leave me alone. I growled. Don't you get it? Go away. And notice how this is in all caps. Oh, sang the chorus of girls. Right? Once again, we have a group versus the individual. I wanted to crawl under a rock. That, too, is a cliché. We try to avoid those in our own writing whenever possible. Derek looked as miserable as I did. And then, horrors, I saw his bottom lip quiver. He looked like he was going to cry. He couldn't cry. If he cried, they'd call him a crybaby, right? So another way to think of this is, um, this is a, a subjunct, or I'm sorry, a conditional sentence, sort of like a, um, a hypothesis. If he cried, they'd call him a crybaby. So, how does she react? We've been tracking her reaction as we were told to, right? Well, she became angry. She yelled at him. And now her reaction is empathy. Even though she's angry, she still understands that he's jeopardizing his reputation and future at the school or what there's left of it. Derek is a crybaby, would follow him around for the rest of his life. I decided. And usually, when there's a big decision made, um, we know that there's a turning point in the story, right? So even though this is nonfiction, it, it seems to have a plot, right? We have our setting, which is a middle school. We have our main character, the narrator the person telling the story, and the antagonist is Derek. Some people might think, all right, 
Why isn't the antagonist the mean friends or mean kids in general? Antagonist just means the counterbalance to the protagonist. So the antagonist is the one who makes the story go for this narrator. Oftentimes that's the bad guy. Like if you take a Marvel film, you know, the bad guy is Thanos, he's the antagonist, and the good guy is Captain America or Iron Man or something like that, right? Here, um, it's, it's not your classic good versus evil. I took the roses and I carried them around all day. Here we have something called the climax. The moment where the character chooses, the main problem here is that there's unrequited affection from Derek towards the main character who just wants to be left alone, Nair being short for narrator, keeps giving her gifts, gifts, gives her these roses. Roses is what that says, it's a little tough to see. Begins to cry, so then what does the character do with the climax? Makes a decision to take the roses and carry them around all day. I never did talk to Derek after that. We nodded politely to each other in the hallway, but I never pretended to like him. And he never gave me another present. Somehow we'd worked it out. I lost track of Derek when his family moved away. I guess you could say this was the first time I did something I didn't want to do just to protect someone else's feelings from getting hurt. Maybe you could call this growth or maturity. I honestly don't know. There is something to help us answer that milestone question, right? Maybe you could call this growth or maturity. A milestone is when you reach a point of maturity or some point in your journey towards maturity and your, your development. Even though it happened a long time ago, I can picture myself. Once again, we have the, we're being told by the narrator to visualize, right? So we're gonna get some imagery. And this imagery is what this, this character wants to leave the reader with. So it's gonna be some important imagery that tells us with some finality what happened uh, to the narrator, how she thinks about it now. I can picture myself on that day striding through the corridor proudly, the dozen roses clenched tightly in my hand, walking tall, feeling like no one could touch me. Walking tall, cliche. No one could touch me, cliched. So we do get this notion that she's proud, right? She never talks to Derek again. So this is really about her, right? And this is her moment of of becoming, of developing, of maturity. Okay. Just so you know, you're then asked to write a summary. We may do that in class. And then consider discussions, presentations, video, and the launch text as you think about the prompt. Record your thoughts here. What rite of passage has held the most significance for you or for a person you know well? Uh, let's revisit the text real quick. Okay. That's what your paper should look like. You should have all of these things. Same here for page seven. Your page seven should look just like that. Show that to me and I'll give you some extra credit. Thank you.